This is an outline of what my uh, talk is going to be. We're going to look at um, mosquitoes in the ecosystem to see whether or not, sorry. Is there a way of making, there, that's good, thanks. I just need to make it bigger. <laughs> We're going to look at mosquitoes in the ecosystem because usually people ask me, well, couldn't we just get rid of all mosquitoes? Wouldn't that be the solution to everything? Well, in fact, they do play a role in the ecosystem. Then I'm going to show you some pictures of mosquitoes up close so that you can see how beautiful they actually are under the microscope. We will then look at mosquitoes that are beneficial mosquitoes uh, because there are, in fact, mosquitoes that we need in the, in the environment. Then we'll get to the nasty mosquitoes. These are the ones that give mosquitoes a bad reputation. Uh, I'll talk a tiny bit about the West Nile virus research that we've done for the past 15 years, and then we'll get on to the meat and potatoes, which is Zika virus. So, I'm often asked, could we do without mosquitoes in the world? And in a paper in Nature in July of 2010, uh, this is exactly what they set out to ask. They, they talked to dozens and dozens of entomologists and asked, could we in fact get rid of mosquitoes? And you're going to see that there are both pros and cons to having mosquitoes around. And I should point out that there are 3,500 species of mosquito worldwide. So when you get bitten by a mosquito, that's just one mosquito out of thousands of species. And I, I really mean true species. It would be you know, as if you had the family mosquitoes, and within it, you would have a lion mosquito, a tiger mosquito, a domestic cat mosquito, a civet, all these different types of pure breeding species within the family Culicidae, which are the mosquitoes. So because there are 35,000, sorry, 3,500 mosquitoes, uh, not to worry, they don't all appear here. We have about 250 in North America, 82 in Canada, and currently 67 in Ontario, although that number may go up by one in the near future. And you can't possibly remember 3,500 names of species if you only had one name for them. So in fact, we use a double-barreled name for all of the species. They have to have a genus name and a species name. So those 3,500 species are divided up into 41 different genera, and each genus has many, many species in it, so it has a double-barreled name. First the genus, and then the specific epithet. And species that you may have been, you may be familiar with include things like Anopheles gambi, which uh, transmits malaria, Aedes aegypti, which is a yellow fever mosquito, and also the one people are saying is transmitting Zika all over the world, and then Culex pipiens, a bird biting mosquito that is involved with West Nile transmission. Just to refresh your memories, <coughs> we have. Uh, adult female mosquitoes take a blood meal in order to mature a batch of eggs. They lay those eggs. The eggs hatch. This is all an aquatic life cycle down here. The eggs hatch into larvae. They go through four larval instars. Then they metamorphose into the pupal stage. And then this undergoes a massive metamorphosis in order to have an adult come out of that. So we've got four life stages, eggs, larvae, pupae, adults, and three of them occur in aquatic habitats, in standing water. And so just to show you how beautiful they actually are, here is an uh, example of some larvae. This is the top of the water. They've got a respiratory siphon, and so that makes contact with the outside air so they can breathe. They can actually close that and go down and swim around. This is the pupal stage, so this is after it's gone through three different molts or four different larval instars, and uh, it's comma-shaped. We like to call them tumblers because they tumble around in the water, and they have respiratory trumpets. They've got a pair of them, again, that keep contact with the outside air, 
So they constantly come up to the surface to get their air. Then, of course, we have males and females. You can tell males and females apart just by looking at their antennae. So this is a male mosquito. He's got these huge plumos antennae, really, really bushy. He uses those to listen for the wing beat frequency of conspecific females. So he can hear if one of his, if there's a female of his species flying around just by listening with these great big bushy antennae. Males are really nice. They don't feed on blood at all. They don't have functional mouth parts to do any blood feeding. They essentially just sip on some sugar meals to get energy for flight. They find females to mate with, and then they're done. <laughs> the females, on the other hand, will feed on sugar, so they have energy for flight. And they pack that sugar in a specialized part of the abdomen called the crop, so that they leave the rest of the midgut open for a blood meal, because blood meals are harder to get, actually. Uh, she only needs to be mated once. She can save the sperm from that male suitor for the rest of her life. And so really, that's all males do is sip some nectar, find a female, and they don't last very long. The females, however, can live for several egg batches. And each time she's going to lay a batch of eggs, she needs to take a blood meal. And she does that using her proboscis. So this is the proboscis all teased apart to show you that there are actually six really sharp stylets in there. And then there's this thing, which is actually the lower lip. It's very fleshy. And so we don't really think of mosquitoes as having fleshy mouth parts. But the bottom lip is a great big structure that's very fleshy. And inside that are the very sharp stylets. And so if you look at this uh, electron micrograph on the right, this, is at, this orange structure that you see is actually the upper lip, which is a great big long thing. And the lower lip is folded around it. So now you have your piercing parts. You have your fleshy lower lip. It goes to feed. It can't stick all that into you because this part's too fleshy. And so as it presses into you, the bottom lip has to move out of the way. And I'll show you that in the next slide. So next time a mosquito bites you, do have a, a look at it. Because <laughs> in side view, this is that big fleshy lower lip that just has to get pushed out of the way and here, this, these are the six really sharp stylets that stay together and poke into you so that it can make a hole and then suck the blood back up. The other thing it does, though, when it uh, inserts its uh, sharp stylets into you, it also spits into you a little bit. And it has to spit into you, I'm afraid, so that your blood doesn't clot while she's trying to drink it. So the female mosquito will spit a little bit of saliva into you that has anticoagulants in it. Um, and then you don't clog up her mouth parts when she goes to feed. And that's going to be important, the fact that they actually spit a little bit into you first, because that's how they transmit diseases. OK, so I hope I've shown that they're really quite remarkable looking. And they also play some really remarkable roles in the ecosystem. 3,500 species, obviously somebody has to be doing something good. Uh, if you go up to the Arctic, to the tundra, there's a huge biomass of mosquitoes every spring. And many of the migratory birds up there gorge on the thousands and tens of thousands of mosquitoes that emerge. And so they're definitely a source of food for migratory birds up in the Arctic. But we also know that there is a certain uh, orchid that is found up in the, uh, in the tundra and also in a little bit further south as well, but in pretty inhospitable 
areas. This is a little green orchid, and it has two little pollinia here. That holds the pollen sacs, and that has to be transferred to another plant, another orchid plant, in order for pollination to occur. And so we have this mosquito, Aedes communis, who lands on this, sticks its proboscis down in here to try and get a sip of nectar. Both males and females are, are going to be doing this. And in the process, bumps against these two pollinia, and the pollinia stick to its head, often to its eyes or its proboscis or its palps. But we can find examples of uh, Aedes communis with these pollinia stuck to its head as many as seven pairs of pollinia. So it's been feeding in a lot of different uh, plants. And I just found this uh, doing my research. In 2015, there was a competition from the National Wildlife uh, Federation. And you can see its wings are actually beating. It's coming out of the, of the tiny little orchid. And it's just been zapped with these pollinia. So this is pollination, or this is picking up the pollinia so that it can pollinate. And just for humor's sake, the, uh, the photographer said that he couldn't use repellents while he was taking these photographs because he didn't want to scare the mosquitoes away. And so we ended up being bitten to, to pieces. So Aedes communis is also a very avid biter, but forget that when you think of the lovely job it's doing of pollinating this orchid. Here's another example. We have pitcher plants. Uh, if you go up to northern Ontario and you go to sphagnum bogs, you'll find pitcher plants. They're known to most people as being carnivorous, but what a lot of people don't realize is the plant itself cannot actually digest the insects, that it has to have a symbiotic relationship with mosquito larvae. And these mosquito larvae are of the, uh, they're actually called Waiomaia smithy, nice long name. This is what the, the mosquito larva looks like. It's in the water, in the pitcher, and it helps to shred and uh, feed on any other insects that fall in. So it itself doesn't get digested by the plant. It's doing all sorts of digestion for the plant, and then the plant absorbs the nitrogen from the, s the liquid that the mosquito larvae are feeding in. And so they are top predators. As it turns out, the females and males have no biting mouth parts whatsoever, so they couldn't even bite you if they wanted to. All they do is mate and lay more eggs in the pitcher plants to, f to have more larvae grow to keep that little pitcher plant community going. But you're not really here to have me try to persuade you that mosquitoes are great, because you know that they can be a real nuisance when you're out in your backyard or up camping or hiking. But also, we know that they are incredible disease vectors. The Anopheles genus is well known for transmitting different types of malaria. Uh, in the genus Aedes, we have species that can transmit dog heartworm. And then there are a whole host of viruses that are transmitted by mosquitoes. And these include things like yellow fever, dengue, West Nile, chikungunya, and the latest on the radar, Zika. So I'm just going to very briefly tell you what makes one species what we call a competent vector. It can transmit uh, a virus, and another species a non-competent vector. It turns out that there are two huge barriers to transmission. So the first thing that has to happen, the female has to ingest a blood meal that already has the virus in it. And that then goes into her midgut. And in the midgut, the digestive enzyme, enzymes start to start breaking down that blood meal. Well, the virus that's in that blood meal has to escape being digested. And in order to escape that, it has to go through the midgut epithelium 
before the mosquito's digestive enzymes knock it out. So it has to get through the mid-gut epithelium un, uh, unscathed, and then it goes out the other side of the mid-gut, and now it's circulating freely in the hemolymph in the mosquito's body. So it's, they don't have blood vessels the way we do. They just have this straw-colored fluid called hemolymph, which is similar to our blood, and things slosh around in there. And so that's where the virus starts sloshing around inside the insect's body. And it can slosh around, it goes into the legs, it can go into the wings, and some of it is going to go into the salivary glands. So the first thing is get out of the midget into the hemolymph, and the second thing is get out of the hemolymph and into the salivary glands. So it has to cross over into the salivary glands and then sit there in the lumen waiting for the next time the female takes a meal and has to start off by spitting and some of that virus comes out. So not all species are good vectors because they may have a block at the salivary gland not allowing virus in or they might have a block at the midgut not letting the virus out of the midgut in the first place. And that's why not all mosquitoes uh, that blood feed are actually capable of transmitting viruses. You'll probably remember, uh, most of you, 1999, when West Nile virus appeared in New York City, and actually in the borough of Queens. And one of the things that they noticed first, yes, dead birds falling from the sky, and they had no idea what was going on. Turns out, West Nile virus is a bird disease. And so there are two cycles. There are mosquitoes that love to bite birds, that bite the birds, pick up an infection, amplify it inside the body, it gets into the salivary glands, and then they go feed on another bird and transmit it. So this is what's going on in the background now, as even this year, we have this background level of bird disease that as long as there are enough birds to be bitten and not too many mosquitoes biting them, it just stays in what we call this enzootic amplification cycle. But sometimes the infection levels in the mosquitoes get so high, the birds then migrate and the mosquitoes are still hungry and they've, they've got the infection and they then feed on other host animals. So they shift their preferences from bird, bird biting to being mammal biting. And all of these different mammals can become infected, but they're all what we call dead end hosts. They cannot produce enough viremia inside themselves to actually give it to a new mosquito. Even though they're dead end hosts, they can get pretty sick. So uh, this is what West Nile is. And we've been looking at this for 15 long years. We know that, I said that in North America there were 250 species of mosquito. In the US, 65 species have been tested, that have been tested have been positive for West Nile virus. That doesn't mean all of these are really good vectors. They may just have it in the body, but it hasn't had a chance to go through the hemolymph and into the salivary glands. So they may not be great vectors, but that's a really big list, 65 potential species. We share most of these species with them, and in Ontario, we've only had 13 species go positive, and these two species, Culex pipiens and Culex restuans, are actually our major vectors. But it's taken us 15 years to really hammer all of this out, and we know that we can follow the infection rates in Culex pipiens and restuans, and we can see whether or not there's going to be an outbreak in humans. And there's not always media coverage on West Nile anymore because it's old news. There was lots and lots of media coverage back in 2002 when we had what we call our 2002 epidemic year, 416 confirmed cases of humans in Ontario with West Nile virus. 
many of them extremely sick with encephalitis, meningitis, acute flaccid paralysis, et cetera. And then, you know, fair to middling numbers of humans being infected. At some points, it looked like it was almost gone. And then 2012, another mini epidemic with 450 people being infected. We think that in the original viral strain that came to New York in 99, was virulent enough, but it got even more virulent in 2002. And so that's why we ended up with a, a spike then. And uh, further mutations for 2012, although a lot of this had to do with how hot the 2012 season was. So I'd just like to show you that we can actually predict now where we're going to get human cases. And um, we're going to do that by looking at the distribution of Culex pipians and restuans. And we're also going to look at the number of infected mosquito pools that we find. So this would be a typical year where there's no epidemic. That's uh, the 2010 year. You can see a few cases, but really it's, it's not a public health emergency. But the two epidemic years, 2002 and 2012, clustering around the Golden Horseshoe and then down in Windsor, Essex County. The same thing in, in 2012. And what if we compare the distributions of the mosquitoes? We find, so here's our uh, 2002 year, our epi first epidemic year, and this is the distribution of Culex pipians and restuans. This is a pretty, hot spot for pipians and restuans, and it corresponds pretty closely with this hot spot of human cases. So we know there's a relationship. Where you have the potential vector, this is where you are potentially going to get uh, infections. But this repeats itself year after year. So why is it that there are only epidemics in some years and not all? Well, <clears throat> Uh, oh, I just further to talk about the, the distribution of the mosquitoes. We find, so this is an epidemic hot spot, and this is West Nile virus mosquito surveillance. Uh, it's actually for 2003, but the 2012 data looked virtually the same. It's just I had this one graphed. These along this axis are the different species of mosquito that we were looking at. And these are the epidemiological week. So this is from the end of May all the way through to the end of October. And you can see in yellow here at the front, this is the relative population of Culex, Pipians, and Restuans. So there is what I like to call a wall of yellow all across the season. And that means lots and lots of Culex, Pipians, Restuans present throughout the season that could be influencing West Nile virus transmission. Let's contrast that with a place like Algoma Health Unit, where there was no transmission in humans in 2012. We'll look at what their distribution looks like. These, again, are the same mosquito species. This is the same contrast in epidemiological week. And this is all they had for Culex, Pipians, and Restuans. Virtually nothing. They had lots of other species, this bright purple one would be Aedes vexans, which is a very uh, fierce biter. And this huge peak at the back is a species called Cochlotidia perturbans that really, really hurts when it bites. But it's no wonder they didn't have uh, a lot of, they didn't have any human cases. They hardly have any of the species that are responsible for transmission. And we can look further at the transmission, and we can relate it to temperature. Because if we have hot temperatures, the virus can replicate more quickly inside the mosquito, has a better chance of getting out of the midgut, through the hemolymph, into the salivary glands, and to be stockpiled in the salivary glands to be spat out at the next meal. And if it's cooler temperatures, well, that transmission or that amplification could be happening, but it might not yet have reached the salivary glands by the time it feeds on another meal. 
and the chance that it will get yet another meal after that goes down. As the female gets older, she has less uh, life expectancy, and she can also be swatted or eaten herself. So the key is warm temperatures for the amplification of the virus. Oops. So we have looked at this. We've modeled it. We set these traps uh, every single week in 37 health units across Canada, um, across Ontario. We also do about 52 First Nations uh, communities setting up these light traps. Well, this is the royal we, obviously. We have other people doing it. Um, and we get the mosquitoes and identify them. And then we test them for virus using um, quantitative RT-PCR. I'm not going to go into the methods for you. But we can definitely predict when we're going to get human cases by looking at, first of all, does that health unit have Culex pipians and Restuans? And if it does, how often do the mosquitoes go positive? So for all the data that we have, all the different years, we can plot the number of positive Culex pools. So these are groups of Culex mosquitoes that have been tested for virus and end up being positive versus the number of confirmed human cases. So when there are less than 100 positive pools, we have few human cases. And those years, here are two epidemic years up here, we had 400 and 500 positive mosquito pools. And indeed, we had the human cases to go along with them. So for people who know anything about stats, apparently, this is a huge R squared value. It's as close to being a perfect fit for this line as you can get without, uh, without it being a perfect fit. <laughs> this is incredibly strong relationship between the number of positive pools and the number of confirmed human cases. So this ongoing surveillance for West Nile virus, although it gets a little bit ho-hum, I have to admit, uh, can actually show us when we have a risk of human cases. And we can look at it one more way. In blue, this is the mosquito cases going positive. And in green, this is the human cases. So this is our first epidemic year. We saw it coming with that increase in the number of human cases. Sorry, this is in blue, the increase in the number of mosquito pools going positive, followed two or three weeks later by an increase in the human cases. And exactly the same thing happened in the second epidemic year, a peak of mosquitoes going positive. About this point, I notified the CBC and said, oh my gosh, we have another epidemic on the way. And sure enough, here's the, the peak in the, in the human cases following it. So what lessons have we learned from West Nile? First of all, we have to know what the vectors are. We have to conduct surveillance so that we identify the mosquitoes and we test them for virus. We then have to look at the areas geographically where the, vi the vector is locally abundant, look at the temperatures, watch the viral testing results, and once you see a sharp increase in the mosquitoes, you know that a sh an increase in the human cases is likely to follow. And that's when you can warn people to protect themselves. So this is my history of working with West Nile. So when Zika came along, I thought, oh yeah, well, we have no risk of Zika here. It's a, a tropical disease. But I'm interested and I'm a bit bored doing West Nile work, I have to admit. And so we know that Zika causes fever and rash and headache and red itchy eyes. It's been around for many years, since 1947. But the thing that was new about Zika was that it, there was a spike in, in the number of microcephalic babies being born in Brazil. And also adults, otherwise healthy adults, coming down with a paralysis called Guillain-Barre syndrome. And so this made 
make Zika a lot more frightening than we had originally thought. So it is a human disease that is often asymptomatic. People will have the virus and not even know they have it. And if they do have symptoms, it's things like this, uh, a rash or conjunctivitis in the eyes. And I'd just like to point out, there are some other things about Zika that have come out. This is the photograph of uh, the back of Dr. Brian Foy, who in 2007 and 8 had been working in a Zika endemic area, came home, said hello to his wife. He hadn't seen her for many months said hello to his wife in a very amorous way, and lo and behold, she contracted Zika. And so he was the first case of documented transfer through sexual contact, that the virus stays active in men's semen for months, which makes it also pretty scary. But before that, we knew that Zika had been found in uh, a rhesus monkey in a forest called the Zika virus. They were actually putting monkeys in trees and trying to look for mosquitoes that transmitted yellow fever. And instead, the monkey got sick with something else and they discovered it was a new virus, uh, Zika virus. In 1948, they discovered a vector. Uh, this is all in Uganda, incidentally. They found a vector, Aedes africanus, and a few years later they found humans who had evidence of having Zika infections, but very, very mild. And in the grand scheme of things, it's a little mild flu, or at least that's what it was up until then. And then there were a few other cases worldwide, uh, the late 60s, 70s, and early 80s. Again, there were some more case, documented cases of Zika, but all, always thought to be pretty mild. Micronesia, there was an outbreak on the island of Yap in 2007. French Polynesia, there was an outbreak in 2013. And I'd just like to show you, this is from an article about that outbreak in the island of Yap. And this is how people live. They have containers everywhere with standing water. And you know that mosquitoes breed in standing water and the mosquitoes, uh, there are plenty of mosquitoes in this environment. And it's really hard to, to control mosquitoes when people have to put out containers to collect rainwater so that they have a source of, of water for themselves, for their homes. In um, 2015, the early part of 2015 in Brazil, about 7,000 cases of people with skin rash uh, and conjunctivitis, but many of them didn't get tested for anything because it was assumed it was just dengue, actually, mild cases of dengue. But in February of 2016, the World Health Organization declared that there was a public health emergency of international concern when they realized that the rashes and, and the illnesses that had come previously were actually then, nine months down the line, related to clusters of microcephalic infants being born and other neurological uh, disorders. So here's 2015 in Brazil. It's now spread all over into Mexico that uh, we've, there is a homegrown transmission of Zika virus. This is really spread uh, very, very fast, and it's quite unprecedented, the speed with which Zika virus is, is uh, moving. So March 2016, I thought, yeah, I'm a little bit bored with West Nile. I'll go down to Maceo, Brazil, go to this conference called uh, the Summit on Controlling Aedes aegypti, with the idea being everybody was saying Zika virus is transmitted by Aedes aegypti. Medical doctors were being interviewed all over the world saying it was Aedes aegypti. World Health Organization, Centers for Disease Control, everybody saying it was Aedes aegypti. So I went down, sat through a week long of meetings. Not a single person had any data from Brazil to show that Aedes aegypti was the vector. And I thought, 
this doesn't make sense. I know from West Nile virus, you've got dozens of species that can test positive, and then you have to whittle it down and figure out who the major players are. Here, they have no data whatsoever, and yet everybody's saying it's Aedes aegypti. So I came back from Maceo, Brazil, and I got on my computer, and I looked at all the old literature that I could find. And I found only eight papers between 1952 and 2014. And in those eight papers, these are all the species that had tested positive for Zika virus. Sure, Aedes aegypti was there, but there were 19 other species in the genus Aedes. And then there were species in non-Aedes, uh, not in the Aedes genus, Anopheles, two species of Anopheles. This is the, the malaria mosquito. Mansonia, Aratmopodites, and Aculex. So for me, it wasn't clear cut that it was all just Aedes aegypti. You look at the evidence historically versus no current evidence. And if you look even closer, that photograph I showed of all the containers that were holding water, that was in Yap in Micronesia. They only found one single specimen of Aedes aegypti when they did their surveillance. But they found 362 specimens of this species, Aedes hensili, and 247 specimens of Culex quinquefaciatus. So Aedes aegypti was so rare as to be really non-existent, and then two other species that were pretty common. And the authors themselves concluded that Aedes hensili was the vector. Note that does not say Aedes aegypti, but for some reason, you know, World Health, CDC, all the experts saying that it was Aedes aegypti. And then this was followed up in 2014 with a 23% uh, dissemination rate. That means that the virus has gotten out of the midgut and it's floating around in the, the body on its way to the salivary glands. And I should just point out that Culex quinquefaciatus was not tested, which is a real shame. So then if you look at other outbreaks in Senegal in 2013, oh, sorry, 2011, they found 13 species tested positive, And they concluded that Furcifer and Vitatus were the big vectors. They did have some Aedes aegypti, but the levels were so low that they just they concluded it was these two. Then finally, in 2015, there is a paper from Mexico showing that Zika could in fact be transmitted by Aedes aegypti. So um, 15 out of 55 pools were positive for Aedes aegypti. They did test Culex quinquefaciatus, but they didn't get any positive pools. So finally, we've got some data for Aedes aegypti. But people can do studies in labs as well. So it's not just going out and collecting from the wild. It's looking at them in the, the lab to see if, they have, uh, if they're capable of vectoring. The original paper here from 1956, Aedes aegypti can be infected, but it's not very efficient, according to the authors. And then a paper from 2015, well, Aedes aegypti, 0% transmission. And then another paper in 2016 concluded unexpectedly low competent vectors for Zika virus. So you've got two camps coming forward. There's even one group who says that they are 100% capable of transmitting. Uh, very small sample sizes, only eight specimens tested and looked at 10 days post-infection. But all of them, eight out of eight, had Zika in the salivary glands. And uh, this other species, Aedes albopictus, which is often grouped together with Aedes aegypti, 12 out of 12 at 10 days had Zika virus in saliva. This is the only paper that has such high levels. And if you look at it really, really closely, because you never believe everything that you, 
you read, obviously. Turns out they fed their mosquitoes, whoops, with vitamin B12, which nobody does. And so we have no idea what vitamin B12 does to a mosquito, but it definitely makes them 100% capable of transmitting a virus. And then uh, Constancia Aries, a Brazilian researcher, discovered that this species, Culex quinquefaciatus, can actually transmit Zika virus. And so it can spit it out in saliva. That's a huge finding because Culex quinquefaciatus is in the genus Culex. And everybody's been saying we have to deal with genus Aedes. But other people say, no, Culex quinquefaciatus can't do it. And then, this is a roller coaster we're on. Uh, I was just recently at a, whoops, oh, crying out loud. I was just recently at a conference in Florida. This is the International Commission of Entomology. And uh, a researcher from China actually got up and showed that Culex quinquefaciatus, which is definitely a, um, a bird biting species usually, but will occasionally feed on humans, that it could transmit Zika virus by bite. And in fact, eight of nine little suckling or baby mice that were fed on by Culex quinquefaciatus ended up with Zika in their brain tissues. So we've got the both camps now, those saying, yes, it's 80s aegypti, although there were many other species they could have looked at, and those that are saying it's, it's Culex species. And following that conference down in Orlando, Newsweek actually ran this piece. Now the Zika virus could make its way north because the Newsweek reporter was quite convinced from the data that were shown that Culex quinquefaciatus, which is also known as the southern house mosquito, may in fact be able to transmit and not just this lovely specimen over here, which is Aedes aegypti. So I think I just want to give you a little bit of information about the virus itself. There are 53 species of viruses in the genus Flavivirus. And some of them that you will re recognize, St. Louis encephalitis, West Nile, Zika, Dengue, and Yellow Fever. And the International Committee on the Taxonomy of Viruses has stated that these are Culex associated, and these ones are Aedes associated. And this was a division that they made back in 1987, before Zika really was doing anything, and people weren't paying any attention to it. But embedded in the literature, Zika is 80s associated. So a paper came out in 2015 looking at the evolution of the flaviviruses. And they put brackets around to show, you know, these are all the ones that are Culex associated. These are all the ones that are 80s associated. And here's Zika stuck in here just at the margin. We've taken this and we've dissected it. And here I've made it much, much simpler for you. So this is West Nile, St. Louis encephalitis, Zika virus, dengue virus, and yellow fever virus. And they are related, all of them are related to the tick-borne uh, flaviviruses. And how you read this, this shows that this whole group is related to one another, and their closest relatives are the tick-borne viruses. These are all related to one another, and their next relative would be this one, and so forth. We know that West Nile and St. Louis encephalitis, which I haven't talked about, these are encephalitis, and so they, f they give you problems with your brain and spinal cord. That's why I've got a little brain up there. We know that dengue and yellow fever are hemorrhagic diseases, so that's why I've got drops of blood. What about Zika virus? Oh, well, we're not going to deal with that yet. <laughs> we know that West Nile and St. Louis encephalitis have bird, they're really bird diseases that just occasionally spill over into humans. 
dengue and yellow fever, they're actually uh, primate diseases, so non-human primate diseases that spill over into the human population. What about Zika? Well, it has non-human primates. There's no bird intermediary, but it causes encephalitis and meningitis and neurological symptoms and microcephaly. So it's definitely more closely related to these in the symptoms, but more closely related to these in the hosts that it uses. And there's a node here. This node is supported 99%. All the other nodes are about 60 or 52. But this node is really, really highly supported by all the DNA sequence information, which means that this is a perfectly good or a, an extremely well-supported node that separates this clade from this one. And this would be the old classification, Culex associated versus Aedes associated. But that doesn't look right, because you've got this primate linking it here, and you've got the brain or neurotropic effects linking it up here. What if we were to do this? Well, still is not right because you know, it just isn't right. So let's not pigeonhole it into one or the other. Let's, in fact, say this is a virus that has been around for, since 1947, but we haven't done enough research on it yet. And therefore, my take home message would be let's keep an open mind. Maybe. Sometimes it has Aedes as a vector, and sometimes it has Culex. And if we keep that in mind, we're actually going to um, solve the problem as opposed to just trying to pigeonhole into one uh, disease vector. So I just want to finish by saying, I then went to Dominican Republic. We set traps. We didn't have CO2, so we had to make our own using a fire extinguisher. <laughs> we looked for 80s aegypti in people's homes. We looked for larvae. We identified the mosquitoes, and we tested them for virus. And we had from mosquitoes collected from inside people's homes who had current Zika infections, we had a single specimen out of 59 that was positive for Zika. So I would have to say, oh, I guess Aedes aegypti is a potential vector. But the traps that were outside, I had a single specimen of Culex that was positive. And so we're no closer to getting to the answer based on this little field study done, done in Dominican Republic. And that's where our CL3 comes in. We now are looking at the the virus in lab colonies and wild-caught mosquitoes from Ontario. We test the abdomen separately so that we know if it was infected. We take the legs and the wings to see if it had a disseminated infection. Was the virus sloshing around inside the body? And we collect the saliva to see if it was possible to transmit. So here's a, a female. We've already taken her legs and her wings off because they're going to be tested separately. And she spits into this little microcapillary tube so that we can collect her saliva and test it using quantitative RT-PCR. We've got several mosquito species at home that we're interested in. Aedes albopictus, the Asian tiger mosquito, is rare. Uh, it's invasive, but it could potentially transmit. Aedes japonicus is a common invasive that could potentially transmit and we have preliminary data for a local common species, uh, Aedes vexans, and also Culex pipiens. And I'm just going to show you these data. This is how we know if the virus was active. We played it out in cell culture. And this is a serial dilution of, the, the, of our solution. This has no virus on it whatsoever. But if there's lots of virus, it kills all the cells. Half that kills almost all of them. And then it's, some of them survive. And the purple are the ones that are surviving. Some of those survive. And this is the, the lowest concentration 
we can see how many particles of virus there were. So we can test to make sure after we've looked at this, have we got virus that can actually infect and uh, transmit. So from our Culex pipians, these are ones that are known as being West Nile vectors. Take those, bring them into the lab, feed them on virus, on Zika virus. And here's positive controls. That's what we actually, we know the, the, the viral titer of those. These are infected Culex pipians after one day. So they all picked up the infection. And then we run some negative controls, some blanks, to make sure that our system's working nicely. And of 50 individuals that we fed on this Thai strain of Zika virus, we looked at them 10 days post-infection. There are so many lines here, it's dizzying. Some of those represent bodies, others represent legs and wings, and still others represent saliva. But you can see that some of them are definitely positive for Zika. And you read these by, if you have an upswing, that's, that's a positive result. Anything that stays below this orange line is negative. And so we have at least one mosquito out of 50, which would only be a 2% transmission rate, which would not be significant you know, in the wild where a single mosquito had bodies positive, legs and wings positive, and saliva positive. And we're still working on all the rest, but we're pretty sure um, we're going to find that other species may, in a perfect situation, be able to transmit just what does that mean overall for Zika virus transmission. I'd like to thank my uh, grad students. We call them Team Zika who do all this work, and lots and lots of students involved, both at Brock and also in uh, the Dominican Republic. I thank you for your attention. I'm sure, like me, I'll just yell for now. You good? Okay. I'm sure, like me, some of you may have some questions for Dr. Hunter. If you have a question, let me know. Sorry. Uh, we're certainly at risk of, with the increased temperatures, of having more species expand their ranges northward. And then once those species get here, they, in the warmer temperatures, they do have the possibility to transmit more nasty diseases. And I was wondering, uh, is there a video or an audio tape I could buy to perfect my pronunciation of all those? <laughs> It's another good question. Is there an audio tape to perfect one's pronunciation of all those species? No. <laughs> Why is it reasonable to infer from the, the numbers of that uh, domestic test as you did? It wasn't so much mosquitoes giving the people virus as the people giving the mosquitoes the virus. Yes, so the question is, is it the mosquitoes given the people the virus or the other way around? When we do collections in the wild and we're picking up um, mosquitoes and testing them for virus, absolutely that's showing that they're picking it up from, from people. However, we're very careful not to choose mosquitoes who have blood in their abdomens. Therefore, even though those houses where we collected them have people who are currently sick, the mosquitoes that we were testing were not ones that are recently fed on them. And therefore, the, 
the conclusion we make is that there's Zika virus trans being transmitted in that locality, and these are potential vectors because they had the virus in them that was not a brand new acquisition. I hope that answers your question. Yes? Yeah, you're, you're saying that uh, in Micronesia, uh, there's a, uh, the people there use open basins to collect water. Well, a friend of mine lives on the island of Saba, down in the, uh, in, in the Caribbean. And uh, he says that in his house, there's a, a cistern, and they have fish in the cistern to eat the, the water down. And then the water is filtered. Why don't they do that in, in the Micronesia? So the question is, the photograph from Micronesia had lots of open co containers for water collection. Why do the people not use something like gambusia, the mosquito fish, to, to um, feed the, or to eat the larvae? I think really the overarching thing that I've noticed is that there's just so much poverty in the places where the big Zika outbreaks are happening, that things that would seem reasonable to us, they just cannot implement. So in wealthier neighborhoods, Zika transmission is actually lower. Uh, the houses that I visited in Dominican also had lots of containers with water that they needed for themselves because they didn't have tap water that was consistent. They um, they also had very porous houses that you could see through the walls. So somebody being sick would be lying on their bed and mosquitoes can just come and go day and night feeding on them, especially if they're ill, because they haven't got the energy to swat them off. Can you put like a filter on top of the basin? If you were to put a, a filter on top of the basin, absolutely that would be a great idea, but it wouldn't cost very much, but they use containers of all shapes and sizes. Just, you know, even something like this would be holding precious water. And I really think it's uh, the, the big outbreaks are occurring where the people are living in poverty. Yes? Uh, if the mosquito is infected with the virus, would the larvae so the question is, if a mosquito is infected with the virus, can she pass it on to her larvae? That is an excellent question, and we have some preliminary data to show that is possible, um, which is a bit frightening. And we also have preliminary data to show that if you do have larvae that are infected because they got it from their mother, that means that your male larvae and your female larvae are going to have it. And when they grow up into being male mosquitoes and female mosquitoes, can those male mosquitoes then transmit during sex? And we also have preliminary data to show that a, an infected male mosquito can actually transmit the virus to an uninfected female. So it's a, it's a crazy system, this one. <laughs> yes? Do these different species cross, cross breed at all and uh, explain why you might find similar vectors in different species? The question has to do with whether or not different species will cross breed and therefore you get your different vector combinations. Uh, the answer is sometimes. <laughs> There are certain species that in certain parts of their ranges are completely reproductively isolated, and yet that same species in a different geographical region may do a little bit of interbreeding with something that should have been a good species. So there's a continuum of, um, some authors will call them subspecies because they can still interbreed, and in other parts of the world, they're distinct species. And so it's all ongoing evolutionary change. Yeah. Well, do, do viruses ever kill mosquitoes themselves? The question is whether the viruses kill the mosquitoes themselves. We have no evidence that the virus will kill the mosquito, 
but we do have evidence that it depends on the health of the mosquito, whether it uh, is a excellent vector or not. So you can take the same mosquito and you can rear it so that, so the same species, rear it under low food and high food conditions. The low food condition mosquitoes will be better vectors than the high food mosquito vectors, which suggests to me that the high food mosquitoes are able to fight off the virus. So to twist that around, there must be some cost to being a vector, but it doesn't look like it kills them. Yeah, uh, I detected a note of frustration when you were describing your dealings with the public health professionals. Uh, and I'm wondering, was there a, a real problem with the professionalism of who and uh, the other people? You'd think mosquitoes being quite famous as a, uh, a disease bearing mechanism would they would actually go to people like you and actually ask for some real data. But it sounds like they were in a big echo chamber just echoing what one person said once. So the question is, am I frustrated with the public health people and um, who were they listening to? They did have experts that they were talking to. And so at that, that conference in Orlando, I got to speak with a lot of the naysayers who, in fact, there was one fellow who'd published a paper and had said, absolutely no way species in the genus Culex can transmit. And it was this quick, quick little paper that he pushed out to support his own you know, paradigm. And after having seen the other experiments that were presented, he came up afterwards and he said, oh, I probably didn't leave them long enough, or I didn't you know, give them the right temperatures to, to grow at. Maybe that's why I got zero all across the board. So um, scientists, like everybody else, go in with their pre preconceived notions. And the preconceived notion for Zika is that it's ADs associated because of you know, the the taxonomists who do the viral taxonomy saying that it's 80s associated. There are, there's a whole layer of information uh, out there that people then just hang on to whatever it is that they want to hear and they run with it. So I think we might have got some people to, to reconsider and to be more open, uh, but it's a hard battle. <laughs> I was wondering your years of uh, field research. Can you recommend a natural insect? <laughs> From my years of field research, the only surefire way not to be bitten is not to breathe. <laughs> Sorry. So that's the first thing they cue in on is your carbon dioxide. So if you can figure out a way of not breathing uh, for a sustained period of time, they won't even be able to find you. Sorry, that was, <laughs> it's not actually crazy. I had somebody from U of T actually contact me to say that he wanted to make face masks that would absorb your, your carbon dioxide and possibly use that as a, a repellent or a way of not getting bitten. But in terms of natural products, um, everybody's heard of DEET. It's been used by the US military since the 40s. If you use it in very low concentrations, it's relative, it is safe. They've done loads and loads of, of tests for DEET, but that's a chemical. And the only natural product that I know of that is as efficacious is 2% soybean oil. But you have to reapply it every 20 to 30 minutes. <laughs> but it will repel them. So if you're only outside for a short period of time, Get your soybean oil. <laughs> Who would have thought? Uh, perhaps you could stay around for a couple of minutes if anybody else would like some mosquito repellent recommendations. Um, I, I, it's interesting, I was just in Florida, in Orlando, and uh, all of the hotel rooms came with a can of off. 
uh, with a little note saying, you know, if you're worried about the Zika virus, try this. We didn't worry about it, but it was quite interesting to see. And I myself killed a mosquito in my kitchen last week. So I'm curious, I, I, since I have the microphone, I'm gonna ask one last question. Um, this, this year, uh, has there, is there any concern about West Nile with the heat or lack of, or lack of water? Did it make it better? Are we okay? This year, the drought really reduced the population of mosquitoes to a very, very low level. However, we still got positive mosquitoes. And my fear would be that people wouldn't even notice the mosquitoes and therefore would not be protecting themselves, but we're still at risk. And it's this last two week period that we've seen a spike in, in positive mosquitoes. So you still have to be vigilant until the first frost. So I'm glad I killed it then. Um, that's great. <laughs> Listen, thank you very much for coming out today and making the extra effort to come out to Toronto on one of our lovely traffic days. And thank you to all of you for coming out today. Let's give Fiona a big round of applause.